My name is Nathaniel Jensen. I specialize in biology. Specifically, as an undergraduate, I majored in molecular biology and bioinformatics, which is a mouthful, but basically looking at DNA sequences in the lab and comparing them with computers, which is what I'm doing heavily now. In graduate school, did my PhD at Harvard. Uh, my undergraduate was at the University of Wisconsin Parkside, and that's where I grew up. Did my PhD in Boston at Harvard University in cell and developmental biology, working on adult stem cells, adult blood stem cells, using mice as a model system to understand how stem cells function with the hopes of improving human stem cell transplants. For example, uh, for cancer patients, they'll sometimes transplant their own stem cells or cells, blood cells from an umbilical cord. Usually the cell numbers are limiting, so if we could figure out how to manipulate those numbers, this may greatly improve treatment. And so now I'm switching more towards what I did as an undergraduate, focusing on comparisons among different species using DNA sequences to try to understand basic questions about their biology and their history. For example, looking for evidence that refutes the evolutionary tree of life, and then trying to discover the things scripture is silent on when it comes to species origin. How do we know how far back ancestry goes? The Bible uses the term kind. It describes breeding as one of the measures of how we identify who is related to whom. Obviously some species are extinct, so we can't apply that test. And there are other nuances to that test that make it a little bit more complicated. Maybe DNA can help us understand this. Also, how did species diversify post-flood? We know that all cats probably go back to a common ancestor. There's a huge diversity in cats, large and small. Tigers to little house cats. How did we get all that variety from two individuals on the ark? Genetic mechanisms are likely at play, and so DNA may help us understand specifically what happened in the last 4,000 years since the flood. And so these are some of the questions we're trying to explore currently, and that background in molecular biology has greatly aided in trying to solve these questions and build up the creation model while exposing the scientific inadequacies of evolution. So my interest in science goes back beyond what I can remember. My dad was a, is still is a dentist, my mother was a nurse, so I grew up in a science-fluent home. But I don't know when my interest was first peaked. I knew I liked science in high school. I was homeschooled through eighth grade, went off to Christian high school, enjoyed chemistry, thought it was a little dry, enjoyed biology, but didn't like insects or blood. I would jump when I saw the pictures of the insects applied to the University of Wisconsin Parkside. They came back with a letter saying we have this new molecular biology program. Uh, my first question was, it sounds great, what is it? And so once I found out, it sounded like a nice fusion between the two disciplines. You had the rigor of chemistry with the medical applications of biology, and so I thought I'd try it out. Along the way, developed an interest in cancer research. So when it came time for graduate school, sent out my resumes, or sent out applications to schools that either had cancer biology PhDs or that had affiliated cancer institutes. So Harvard, the Harvard program was affiliated with the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And so I wound up in a stem cell lab, partially because at that time, which was 2004, the connection between stem cells and cancer was just uh, becoming in vogue and was the hot topic for research. So I figured if cancer stems from the stem cell-like cell, or if there's some sort of organic connection between the two, it would be useful for cancer research to know how cells normally operate so that we can better understand how they go awry. So my background in creation goes back to my homeschool days. My mother taught us using curriculum uh, that was Young Earth based, so Bob Jones, Becca Press, those sorts of things. Grew up under ICR. I joked with John Morris saying I remember the mustache days, hearing lectures given by him when he still had his mustache. I remember hearing his dinosaur talk and talking about the sound from the jungle that may have been a dinosaur. So I really see myself as a second generation. Devoured probably any creation book I could get my hand on in high school. And so when I went off to secular college, was prepared to take the argument to my secular friends instead of vice versa. I remember Biology 101 evolution coming up and answering the questions on the test saying this is the answer you're looking for but here's what I think. 
and having discussions with them afterwards. Biology 102 was evolution much more hardcore, so would raise my hand to class when appropriate without being disruptive and try to make sure my fellow students heard that there was a different perspective. So if a high school student came to me who was interested in science and said, what school should I go to? I would say don't go to any school, any college, even if it's Christian in name, until you've been thoroughly grounded in the creation message and the creation evidences so that you can defend the science of creation in class. And I should add on top of that, you should be thoroughly grounded in the biblical basis for creation science because that's going to be attacked even more so in a Christian school. I see it as dangerous to go off to these schools or these experts, and they are experts, teach you in a very persuasive way the wrong thing. You have to be grounded in the truth before you go off and get an education. So it may require delaying school somewhat. Uh, in my case, I had the privilege of being homeschooled for, through eighth grade, so I, I had that background, went to worldview conferences, and then of course read a lot of these books in my own time, or maybe even as part of the curriculum, I don't remember exactly. So I had this grounding in creation science so that these, I knew what was coming. And if you don't know what was coming, it's going to hit you blindside and may persuade you the other way. And that would be a great tragedy because all that is false. The earth is not millions of years old. Evolution is not true and this is not the biblical way to think about these issues. And it does enormous damage to the gospel to capitulate. So don't go anywhere until you've been grounded. Once you've been grounded, I almost find the secular university a more favorable setting for a believer than, a, than the Christian setting, with a few caveats. Now I commuted during my undergraduate days, so a lot of the debauchery that, goes, that takes place on secular campuses I was able to avoid. Same thing in graduate school, I either lived by myself or lived with other believers for my entire time, and I was able to avoid the rampant immorality and, and other typical sins that characterize university campuses these days. So I wouldn't advise living on campus or living with unbelievers because it, it really, uh, it's such a drain on your, on your Christian standards and you wouldn't want to be compromised and compromise your Christian, Christian witness because you fell into it. So you have to be grounded there as well. And I say university, secular university is better in some cases because there the difference between Christian and non-Christian is fairly black and white. You go off to a Christian school most people would probably claim to be Christian. All the professors would likely claim to be Christian, yet they would advocate very unbiblical views. And I find a professing evangelical who argues unbiblical views more persuasive, I think, than an unbeliever. You know the unbeliever is going to obviously advocate unbelieving things, or unbelieving the, the doctrine of an unbeliever. So you know what to expect. The Christian you expect to buy by scripture, so when it's someone who's claiming to be a Christian, advocating an unbiblical view, you can't dismiss it quite as quick. And that seems to be, that, that sort of slow erosion seems to do more damage than the frontal assault you'll get in a secular classroom, but which you'll be able to recognize as such immediately and not feel threatened by it. On the other hand, if you go off to secular campus, depending on where you go, the level of persecution may be higher. There are obviously some campuses these days where the professors seem to have as their goal deriding and making fun of believers and especially of creationists. And so they may deliberately try to flunk you. And that's something to keep in mind. And I can't name the schools that would do it and those that wouldn't, but that's obviously one risk you take. Risk only in the human sense, in the divine sense, God's providence rules all things and there's nothing to fear once you've made the choice. Uh, I'm thinking strictly in terms of you, the student, what's most threatening to you. To me, my guess is, in terms of your own personal faith, a Christian environment may be more threatening if it's compromised than a non-Christian environment because you can see where the error is much more easily in the secular environment than in the Christian one. If someone came to me and said, I'm going off to college, what should I keep in mind? You've already made the decision, I'm going to go to this school or this school. I guess the words of wisdom for any of these students would be your most important task in college is maintaining your relationship with the Lord 
and staying grounded in the scripture. So practicing all the things scripture strongly exhorts, you have to be in fellowship with other believers. It doesn't matter how grounded you are in creation, if you start drifting astray, and that's the point of the book of Hebrews, and it, beware lest you drift, you're headed for trouble regardless of your upbringing. So you have to be in fellowship, obviously, in the Word of God, obviously in prayer. Uh, and if you're in a secular environment or some environment where the persecution gets intense, that support network will play and you'll value that support network even more. So don't lose touch with that. Be aware of campus groups. Some of them, some of the popular ones, tend to be compromised on creation uh, because they try to maintain an undenominational focus. So don't be surprised by that. Uh, and, and be aware that this is yet another way in which the doctrine of creation and the veracity of scripture is being undermined by evangelicals coming and saying, well, you don't have to take that quite so seriously, or don't take such a strong stand on that issue. Those are subtle ways to undermine the authority of and integrity of the scripture, which ultimately undermines your own faith and the faith of those around you. So those things have to be practiced. Do as much as you can, especially if you're in science, to keep up to date on the creation issues. Books are the best way to do this. Those are usually dated, and if you progress further in science, you're going to have to keep up with the peer-reviewed literature. And of course, creationists have their own peer-reviewed journals. The three major ones these days are the Creation Research Society Quarterly, which is uh, by subscription. You have to pay for it. Journal of Creation is by subscription, though the articles come out for free after a year. And the Answers Research Journal is free online. So there's a way to keep up to date on what's the answer to the latest evidence that has come out, or what's the latest positive creation evidence. And of course, once you've progressed far enough, you're going to be the one writing those articles. So constantly staying abreast of what the key issues are, what the key evidences are, what the key arguments are, is vital to having a su successful career as a creationist in science. Now for someone who says, uh, I'm interested in the origins issue, what should I do? There it gets a little sticky. Any program that is evolutionary biology focused, geology focused, anything dealing with an origins topic, evolution is going to be the major subject. People ask me, how did I make it through graduate school? Well, I didn't work in an evolutionary biology field or something origins related field. I did regular science. Of course, regular science, in, in empirical science has nothing to do with evolution. It doesn't depend on evolution and it doesn't come up. But if you're going to focus on something that deals with the past, that's likely going to be more difficult. So for a student who's interested in that, I might almost advise taking a slightly different track and then exploring that later once you've earned your credentials, because you're likely going to face an uphill battle the entire way if you do something that has origins as its primary focus.